I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my administrative law class about the case State v. Loomis. This is from Wisconsin in 2016. And here we're talking about algorithmic due process at sentencing. Now for my students, why is this case in your casebook? Really for purposes of illustration. Um, it, it's a state Supreme Court case, so it's not binding nationwide. Please note that. Um, it's not a big precedential case for due process. On the other hand, it illustrates it, some interesting concepts about modern applications of due process doctrine. And it's sort of a hot topic, right? When we talk about using uh, computer programs and algorithms and art artificial in intelligence to profile suspects or even to determine and, and factor in what someone's sentence should be after they plead guilty to a crime. So let's look at the case. Wisconsin, um, the district attorney charged Eric Loomis with five criminal counts related to a drive-by shooting. Now, Loomis denied involvement in the shooting, but admitted that he drove the same car involved later that evening. And so Loomis pled guilty to two lesser charges, attempting to flee a traffic officer and operating a motor vehicle without the owner's consent. So he was not convicted of the homicides in the case. Now, <clears throat> for sentencing, a state corrections officer produced a uh, pre-sentencing investigation report that included a compass risk assessment, and that classified Loomis as high risk of reoffending. Compass risk assessments estimate the risk of recidivism based on the defendant's statements, uh, answers to a questionnaire, and information from the defendant's criminal record, and it also gives a needs assessment for possible rehabilitation of the offender. Now, Compass uses a proprietary algorithm that considers some of the answers to a 137 item questionnaire. It was developed by a private company and Compass has been used in New York, Wisconsin, California, Florida, and other jurisdictions. It's intended in theory to correct for judges biases. Right? And, and it's increasingly used in these pre-sentencing investigation reports. Now, Compass's methodology is a trade secret. So only the outputs or estimates of recidiv recidivism risk are reported to the court. And the trial court in this case referred to the Compass assessment in its sentencing decision. And based in part on that assessment, sentenced Loomis to six years in prison and five years of probation thereafter. Now, remember, this was not for homicide. He had pled guilty um, to uh, using the car, basically. And, um, and so this was, he objected to this. Now he claimed that the court's reliance on Compass violated his due process rights and specifically his right to an individualized sentence and his right to be sentenced on accurate information. And these are concepts that should sound familiar to students studying administrative law. Now Compass reports provide data only relevant to certain groups. And he also objected, for example, that the risk assessment took gender into account and gave you a higher, said you were at higher risk if you were male. Now, critics contend that the use of these types of computer programs and algorithms in criminal sentencing reinforces existing inequalities. Why? Because it's based on data about um, uh, certain people groups, including race and how likely they are to commit crime. So if we have existing or a history of racism in that selects minorities for, to charge with crimes more often or gives them um, longer sentences, then the program that's based on that is going to assume that, um, that minorities commit more crimes, right? And then when we have a new individual, it's going to um, profile him as being at high risk. And it provides only aggregate data on risk uh, for groups of people. And the upshot is, or end, re uh, end result, minorities are more likely to be assessed as posing a higher risk of reoffending or recidivism. For example, black offenders are nearly twice as frequently incorrectly predicted to reoffend in the future by this program. And so now that's not saying that 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 the error that the program is wrong half the time, but it's saying that it's wrong twice as often if you're black as if you 
are not. So um, now due to the lack of transparency of methodology, judges can't fully evaluate and appropriately weigh the assessment's estimate. And some actually may lack understanding of how the assessments and calculations even work. So what's the holding here? Um, if you're looking for the bottom line from this case, the Wisconsin Supreme Court held that the use of algorithmic risk assessment and sentencing does not violate due process rights. So this is one of our state Supreme Court saying, actually, this does not offend due process, but they also held that these pre-sentencing investigation reports that include compass assessments must contain a written disclaimer so that judges can properly weigh the assessment and are have been warned that the tool is not infallible, that it is inaccurate related specifically to minority offenders. Now, um, uh, some takeaways from this case or things to think about for our course themes are State v. Loomis nicely captures some of the practical dilemmas that are inherent in taking the due process concept and applying it to a context where human adjudicators now rely, at least in part, on computers to make decisions about things like risk assessments for sentencing and how, like, in other words, how likely you are to reoffend or uh, commit more crimes and pre-trial detention, so how likely you are to commit crimes if they let you out on bail. And these implicate interests that are protected by due process. Loomis also shows how questions of due process can arise far outside the context of regulatory agencies, even though that's the focus in an administrative law course. So plaintiffs advance due process arguments, not only in the administration of public benefits or regulatory programs, but also in the expansive criminal justice system, which affects millions of Americans. And that concludes our lecture on State v. Loomis.